Good evening everybody and welcome to our third Virtual Noir at the Bar. For those of you who don't know, I'm Vic Watson. I run the Harrogate and Newcastle chapters when we're out in the real world. But as it is, I'm sitting in your lounge with you or your dining room or wherever you happen to be. The bath perhaps. Anyway, tonight we have readings from Githa Lodge, Trevor Wood, Effie Merrill, Louise Mangos, Danny Marshall, Neil Broadfoot if he ever turns up, Rob Parker, Martin Taylor, Eve Smith and Chris Merritt. As many of you already know, but I have to say this because some of you are joining us for the first time tonight. Noir at the Bar started in 2008 in Philadelphia in America, thanks to the wonderful Peter Rosowski. And since then, it's spread across the US and to the UK. And I've been running Newcastle for four years, um, I think next month or the month after. So yeah, it's been going quite a while and it's just got bigger and bigger. And it's a delight that we're able to do this for you while we're in lockdown. It's really lovely as well to have people joining us from overseas. So um, hello to all of you. Just a delight to have you here. Thank you very much for joining us. Lots of the hosts have decided to try and go virtual now. So I know next week, um, Jackie and Kelly of Edinburgh are going to be doing a virtual noir at the bar too next Thursday. And I believe there's some, some plans afoot in America as well. So I'm hoping to keep the events as close to the real thing as possible. There will be books to win. If you would like to win a book or be entered into the prize draw tonight, please email this wonderful email address. Rather than me having to read it out to you a million times, I've just stuck it up there. So hopefully that makes things a bit easier for you. If you'd like to talk about us on social media this week, please use the hashtag VNATB. You can see that I've been really on point this week and I'm pretty pleased with myself. You can use the chat function at the bottom. Um, we have the wonderful Nikki Black who is bouncing for us. So if we have any troublemakers, you're out. Watch what you're doing. Behave yourselves. Um, you can use the question and answer icon at the bottom as well. So if you want to ask any of our readers anything this evening related to writing and reading, please. Let's keep it clean. Um, please do drop a question in and I will endeavour to ask them where possible. Um, generally, if you're in, in an actual bar with me standing at the front with a microphone and maybe a drink and a packet of crisps, um, we have audience participation. We do ask that you give us a drum roll while we're pulling names out of the hat. I won't be able to hear it, but it'll just be nice knowing that it's there. Also, if you hear anything impressive when I'm introducing you to our writers this evening, I do expect to hear the oohs all the way from your home. I don't care if you're in Europe, I expect it to be loud enough that I, in Whitley Bay, hear it. So, without further ado, thank you so much for joining us um, and welcome to the third Virtual Noir at the Bar. Who's going to be first tonight? Give that a good old shake. This is somebody who's joining us, um, not from the UK this evening, this is Louise Mangos. Um, and she's reading from Switzerland this evening. So. What can I say? We're truly international and I'm delighted to have her here. So, Louise Mangos writes novels, short stories and flash fiction, all fueled by lashings of Prosecco. Her two published suspense novels, Strangers on a Bridge and Her Husband's Secrets, are set in different parts of Switzerland where she's been living since the Thatcher administration drove her out of the UK more than 30 years ago. She will be reading um, one of her standalone short stories this evening, also set in Switzerland. This short story that Louise will be reading tonight was actually long listed for the CWA sponsored Marjorie Allingham short story competition a couple of years ago. Ooh, I didn't quite hear that. So next time I expect it to be louder, okay? But without further ado, everybody, please welcome Louise Mangos. So there we go, I've unmuted myself. Hello everybody. This is my short story, it's called The Perfect Hike. I suspected you'd been having an affair with Sylvie from accounting for months. I'd seen the signs. You hadn't taken into account, excuse the pun, my detective skills. The sneaky lover versus the shrewd wife. At your company Christmas dinner, we dipped our forks with the rest of the company executives and their spouses into bubbling pots of fondue. I threw back shot glasses of white wine to avoid your furtive looks at Sylvie across the table. The blush on her face as you, your forks lifted together, entwined with strings of gruyere, almost made me gag. But your hefty year-end bonus kept me quiet. 
I wasn't prepared to head back to England's uncertain economic future with a paltry divorce settlement based on some ancient patriarchal Swiss law. I'd see it through to the end of your contract for my own financial protection. So I let your affair go on through the new year and into spring. There was a marked increase in overtime, departmental meetings, a few impromptu business trips, and a string of clients you were required to take out to dinner. Then last Saturday, I suggested we go for a hike. What a grand idea, you said. When we get back, I'll pop to the butcher and get a couple of steaks. We'll have a barbecue and I'll crack one of my vintage Bordeaux. Whoa, this was what was referred to in his corporate marketing terms as a unique selling point. It was a bright May day. Snow still sat on the high alpine peaks with sturdy footwear and small day packs with sna snacks, water and a flask of coffee. We hiked up a steep forest track at the south end of the valley. Almost at the top, we stopped at a viewpoint. Holding onto a cable secured by iron posts, we looked over the edge to the lake far below. My stomach lurched and I stepped back. Wouldn't take much for somebody to trip off this ledge, you said, trying to shake the cable with your hand. They wouldn't survive the fall, you mused. Hey, let's take a selfie. I moved towards you warily as you pulled out your mobile phone. You turned us both around and touched the reverse symbol on the camera. My smile belied my nervousness as you clicked away, changing the ang angle to take in more of the valley behind us. Perfect, you exclaimed. I stepped away from the gaping chasm at my back and let out a breath. I put my pack on the pine bench in the clearing and pulled out two ham rolls I'd prepared earlier at home. Clever girl, you said as I handed one to you. Thanks. You bent down to place your phone on the bench before retying your boot laces. I poured coffee into the thermos cup and passed it to you. Beautiful, you said. I followed your gaze to the view when I realised you weren't referring to me or the coffee. I don't have much head height for heights anymore, I said. You're such a chicken. Here, you said, handing me the cup. Call of nature. You stood up, stuck the roll in your mouth and unzipped your trousers. A familiar liberating shake told me you were going to urinate. Your thighs leaned against the cable as drops of golden urine twinkled in the sunlight. I hoped no one was scaling the cliff below. You began to hum the tune to the lonely goat herd muffled through the bread. As I snorted with laughter, your phone vibrated once on the bench beside me. I glanced down at the screen. It was from Sylvie. Okay, car park outside Butcher, 2 p.m., kiss. What the hell? Even today you couldn't leave that cow alone? Well, you couldn't have both of us, you smug bastard. In fact, you couldn't have either of us. I slammed the coffee cup down on the bench and stood up. You hesitated mid-flow and half turned towards me. I ran at you, wrapped my arms around your legs and lifted with all my might. I thought I'd miscalculated that you were too heavy, but then your upper body folded over the cable. Your feet came flying up and hit me in the stomach. Your hands grappled the edge of the cliff below. I gave one mighty shove and with a quiet rustle and a whoosh, you were gone. There was a gaping silence, as though you'd sucked all the air over the edge with you. I stared at the empty space where you'd been as the sound of birdsong filtered innocuously through the trees. Stepping backwards, my calves met the slab of the bench and I sat down heavily. It felt like hours had passed, but when your mobile phone buzzed with Sylvie's repeated message, I realised it hadn't even been a minute. I grabbed the phone and threw it after you. It seemed strange to be able to make these things disappear. You, your ham roll, your phone. I called the police. 117, it's one of those numbers drilled into the company wives when we first moved here. There was only so far they could access in their four wheel drive vehicles. And like us, they had to hike up the last part of the mountain trail. There were two cops. The younger one was kind and said I looked a little pale. His older barrel-chested companion was a little out of breath. He narrowed his eyes and asked me to tell him exactly what happened. He was peeing over the cliff, I said. He raised an eyebrow. Wasserlosen, I explained, thinking he'd misunderstood. And his phone buzzed in his pocket. He took it out, still holding on with the other hand. I pointed to an imaginary appendage I didn't possess. He pressed the screen with his thumb. He fumbled. The phone slipped out of his hand into midair. He reached out and... Oh, over he went. I mimed the actions, visualising the whole scenario. Oh my God, I said dramatically. Do you think he's... I clocked the younger cop's look. Are you kidding me, lady? Before he cleared his throat. 
the air team will determine whether he survived the fall. Was he wearing any bright colors? It might help find him faster. I described his clothes, khaki hiking trousers and a dark red shirt. The older cop sidled up to the edge and looked over, his hand on the radio at his chest. A Swiss-German conversation echoed and crackled static back and forth amongst the trees. I turned to my backpack. The younger one raised his finger. I'm cold, I need my jacket, I explained. At some point I knew I should summon some tears, but they just wouldn't come. I'm sorry, you will have to wait for forensics. What? I said. You think I had something to do with this? Protocol, Fräulein. I'm sorry. I sat down and crossed my arms tightly. The policemen conferred and the young one pulled my jacket from my pack, patting it gently across my shoulders. It's okay, he said. A thumping red helicopter approached from the other side of the valley and hovered for a while. The radio emitted a loud squawk. When the cops turned to look at me, I felt the blood rush to my face. He's... I asked. Es tut mir leid. I'm sorry, the older cop said. They will take the body to Zurich. You will be able to see him there, he said. Where were those damn tears? Two more men arrived up the hiking trail. When they swung their packs to the floor, it was apparent they were the forensics team. One of the guys knelt down in front of me. It's routine, he said. You mean you have to rule out any suspicion, I said. He flashed me an apologetic smile. Out came what looked like portable science kits. Scalpel swabs, little pots and bags for storing evidence, a camera. Surely this was all pointless. I'd be contaminated anyway. They examined, me, examined my hands, went to the barrier, took photos, swabbed the metal cable, took samples of grass and gravel. But the routine seemed half-hearted. I could tell I'd got away with it. The older cop sat down on the bench. The mountain must be respected, he said gently. She is often cruel to claim people before their time. Is there anyone we can call? Someone who can comfort you? I sniffed and shook my head. My mom, but she's in England. I have no one here, I said. I thought I saw the glint of a tear in the cop's eye. We will arrange for someone to talk to you about the trauma. You must be in shock. It is a terrible thing. I'm so sorry. He put his arm across my shoulder and I leaned into him, smelling the sour sweat of his hiking effort. I finally felt the prick of tears. We can go to the car now, said the younger one. You okay? I nodded and stood up, my jacket slipping from my shoulders. At that moment, one of the forensics team turned from the ledge with his camera and a clutch of sample bags. His body was silhouetted against the brightness of the empty sky. His bustling task work suddenly stopped. He was staring at me, or more precisely at my torso. The other's gazes followed his own. I looked down too. And there, below my stomach on the front of my navy blue hiking shirt, were the perfect dusty imprints of a pair of Vibram hiking boot soles. That's the end. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for kicking us off, Louise. Um, those of you might have noticed that our, tap, our I'll try that again, tardy panellist Broadfoot has actually turned up. It was good of you to join us, Neil. I'm only joking. It is good of you to join us. So thank you very much. Your name is now in the hat. So who's going next? Don't forget, folks, if you want to do any questions and answers, you do have a Q&A button down here for anybody. If you've got any burning writing or reading related questions. If you want to be entered into the competition to win a free book, drop me an email with the subject line enter. And our second reader is Martin Taylor. Martin Taylor writes, and I'm just gonna tell you because uh, he's not very nice to himself or me. I get the writers to write their own introductions. So don't think I'm being harsh to Martin when I read this, okay? So he writes mostly low fantasy, although Rod Glenn described his Monkey C from Wild Wolf Publishing as a cracking supernatural noir. His half dozen published novels are set in his native Northumberland or London, where he spent way too much time before escape and home. He is reading the first chapter of The Dancer is Dead, a conventional noir set in Tyneside, for which I am apparently wholly responsible for for him writing so yes apparently this is my fault everybody martin taylor 
Yeah, Vic is responsible. I attended the first noir at the bar and decided I had to write something um, probably noir after that. And she actually edited the book. So The Dancer is Dead, chapter one. Barry Dance was a big man in every sense of the word, not just physically. He walked into a room and everyone there suddenly felt small, the breathing difficult. 60 years old with cropped gray hair, he had a network of vein on his cheeks that spoke to an adulthood of living too well. He pressed the icon on the Range Rover fob and heard the locks click shut on the other side of the closed stable door. Then he slipped the padlock through the hasp, closed it and thumbed the number dials. That far out in the countryside, some people didn't believe they needed to lock their doors. But the dancer was a city boy, born and bred. He locked everything because there were people like him around. He walked towards the farmhouse, his footsteps like gunshots, crunching the pale beige gravel underfoot. The light above the front door didn't come on as he approached, and he frowned, making a mental note to check the system. What was the point of having security precautions if they didn't work? He quickly opened the three locks, stepped inside, and switched on the hall light so he could see to kill the alarm in the 30 seconds he had between opening the door and an automatic call being made to the security firm in an anonymous industrial shed on the team valley that he owned. He punched in the code and the red light turned green just in time. Draping his leather coat over the new post, he walked through into the lounge and poured himself a large Glenlivet, half filling a cut crystal tumbler with the whiskey. He wasn't going to be driving again that night, so it didn't matter how much he drank. As the warmth hit his guts, he felt the stress and anger inside him just evaporate, leaving him clear-headed and relaxed. Why had he allowed himself to get so wound up because his children disagreed with him about the future of the family firm? Kids, who needed them? Especially his. They all knew so much better than he did because he'd been tipped out under the street at 14. Yet somehow made enough of himself to send them to the Royal Grammar School and University after that. Except for young Barry, of course. Knew better than him, did they? Yeah, right. He took another swig of whiskey, savouring it, and then letting it slide its fiery way down his throat. Good scotch. Was there anything it couldn't dissolve or show in a better light? Another mouthful, which drained the glass, only reinforced the belief. The medicine worked, so he poured himself into the dose. Turning, he saw the man in the doorway, which was a surprise, such a surprise he almost dropped his glass. Ever since before he could remember, he had always known when anyone else was near, even in his sleep. It was a survival threat when he was younger. Who the fuck are you? he demanded. The words evaporating as he saw his shotgun in the man's hands. Thousands of pounds of Purdy's very best over and under 20 ball. It looked much more at home in those hands than it did in his. He might not admit it, even to himself, but the dancer was a lousy shot. He much preferred weapons that were extensions of his hands, weapons he could get up close and medieval with. How did you get that? The gun lived in his locked cabinet, the only key on his key ring. His answer was both barrels fired in quick succession. The impact destroyed his face beyond all recognition and lifted him off his feet, the back of his ruined head slamming into the solid of the sideboard. Had he not already been dead, that blow would have killed him. Blood torn apart brain and pulverized skull found it everywhere, creating a sticky red leg on the parquet floor beneath what was left of his head. The killer waited until Dancer's blood stopped pumping, then stepped forward and put the shotgun into the dead man's right hand. Standing back, he took out a mobile phone and photographed the body. Then, unhurriedly, but without pausing, he left the house the same way he had entered it, through the front door, having to reset the alarm. He went round to the back of the farmhouse, over the three-bar fence, and then set off through the trees, over the open moor to where his car was parked, hidden in a sparse copse of firs that were due to be cut down next week. Switching on the engine, he removed his gloves, dropped them into a Sainsbury's carrier bag, and warmed his fingers before the air vent. He would dispose the rest of his clothes when he got home. There was time enough for everything, if you were organised, and he was. 
When he turned south onto the road and set off towards Newcastle, he switched on the car radio and immediately, immediately began to sing along. All right now. Sometime after the killer had left, a small dark Citroen pulled up in the courtyard and a tall, slender young woman got out. She wore a clinging green dress, her dark hair piled on top of her head in a sophisticated ver version of the beehive currently fashionable among younger women. Quickly, she exchanged the flat shoes she used for driving with shoes that matched her dress, shoes with six inch heels. She stood at the door with a willowy, long legged confidence few women, women managed, however many aspired. Glancing at the cold gold watch on her left wrist, she knocked at the door and waited. After a while, she knocked again. When there was no answer, she bent over so her face was level with the letterbox, which she pushed open so she could call through it. Mr. Dance, Mr. Dance, I'm Jessica, Mrs. Bainbridge sent me. No response came from inside the house, and no matter how she craned her head, she couldn't see inside. Eventually, she stood up and walked back to her car, shaking her head. She was sure she'd come to the right place. But when she got out her phone to check with Mrs. Bainbridge, she discovered there was no reception that far out in the back of beyond. Shit. Deciding to give it one more try, Jessica went back and rattled the letterbox. The noise was very loud in the silence. Surely he could hear it even if he was in the bathroom. Nothing. She returned to her car, cursing. She really, really needed that money. And she laughed. Of course she needed the money. Why else would she have come all the way out here to get fucked by a man she didn't know except for the money? At least Mrs. Bainbridge would give her a call out fee and mileage. If she called in as soon as there was a reception, maybe there would be another client for her. The Citroen spat gravel from beneath its wheels and she drove away as quickly as she could. Then only silence remained. And that's it. Thank you so much, Martin. That was Martin Taylor, everybody. Um, okay, Louise, I've had a question for, from Dan Stubbings. By the way, I must say, Dan, happy birthday to your dad. I hope he's having a lovely day. Louise, Dan is asking, how much does Switzerland influence your writing? Thirty years. Um, Yes, I don't know if you heard that, but I was unmuted or muted, I'm not sure. But considering I've lived here for the past 30 years, I think I've got my setting fairly well organised. Um, it's definitely influenced my writing. Um, most of my, both my novels are set in Switzerland and a lot of my short stories are set here. So, yeah, big influence. Thank you. OK, so we've got one more reader before we go for a break because my drink's looking a bit empty. Right, and our next reader is Chris Merritt. Chris Merritt is a crime author and clinical psychologist who lives in London. His first th thriller series featured detectives Botang and Jones and centered on police corruption and organized crime. Imagine Line of Duty meets Top Boy. For Chris's second series, he tapped into his old job to create NHS psychologist, Dr. Lexi Green who starts out as Detective Dan Lockhart's therapist before he asks her to profile a serial killer attacking women in London. The book, Knock Knock, tackles the topics of online misogyny and male-female power relations. Chris will be reading an extract from Knock Knock this evening. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you Chris Merritt. Thanks very much, Vic. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, as Vic said, I'm going to be reading from uh, Knock Knock, that may be appearing backwards on your on your screens, uh, which is my new book out now on Amazon. Um, I'm going to read two short scenes from the beginning of the book. Uh, in the first, we are inside the killer's head as he watches his next victim. And after that, we meet our two main investigators, D.I. Dan Lockhart and Dr. Lexi Green. If she'd known it was to be her last night alive, he wondered, how would she have spent it? Gossiping in an overpriced bar with her friends and dancing until the early hours, or hooking up with one of those square-jawed randoms she seemed to collect on Tinder. Perhaps she'd get sentimental, 
gathering her relatives privately for a solemn, tearful goodbye. Knowing her, though, his guest was hosting an obscenely expensive, self-aggrandizing charity bash with champagne and fireworks. She certainly wouldn't have chosen to sit alone like this, tapping away her final hours at a computer. Standing in darkness opposite her house, he watched her through the porthole window in her garden wall. She was sitting at her desk in the study, totally absorbed in her own world, oblivious to his observation. If only she knew what he had planned for her. His memory of the last one was still sharp and fresh, setting his skin tingling and his heart racing as he recalled it. The whore's initial reluctance to play his little game by slipping the ring onto her finger. Her frown of discomfort shifting to full-blown terror as she realised what was happening. Panic as her windpipe closed and the oxygen in her lungs started to run out. Then the light in her eyes fading as her brain slowly shut down. He'd never felt so potent. He had all that to look forward to again tonight, except that this time it would be so much more meaningful. Like the rest of her kind, this one was promiscuous, duplicitous, treacherous. She had to pay for what she'd done to him, for what they were doing to men everywhere. This would be another step towards restoring the natural order of humanity, man dominating woman. And it was just the beginning. There were many more of those steps to come, with little chance of anyone being able to stop him. He'd arranged it too carefully. People called him a planner as though it was a bad thing, rolling their eyes and switching off whenever he started to go into the details of stuff. Well, they'll want to know all about his planning once her body is discovered. He guessed that'd be some time tomorrow. Then the media feeding frenzy would start, scavengers picking over her carcass while the public gobbled up their news coverage like swarming locusts. He couldn't wait. There was one individual out there that he particularly wanted to take notice. A man who'd guided him gently along the rocky road, shepherded him through the storm, helped him rebuild. His protector, his advisor, his mentor. And when he heard about this, he'd understand what was going on. He'd be pleased because this is exactly what he wanted. Through the window pane, he saw her shrug off her fluffy dressing gown without taking her eyes from the screen. Underneath were those blue silk pajamas he loved. They were his favorite. Despite loathing her and everything she represented, he could admire the way those pajamas shimmered and slid against her skin for hours. But it was time to act now. Dipping a hand into his coat pocket, he extracted the little black box. Carefully, he prized it open and made a final check that he had the ring ready. Satisfied, he tucked it back into his jacket, picked up the rest of his gear and crossed the road towards her front gate. Reaching out with a gloved hand, he pressed his fingertips to the wrought iron and felt it yield. The gate opened silently. She should have put a lock on it. Detective Inspector Dan Lockhart glanced at his watch as he marched up the path towards the Victorian red brick building that housed the Southwest London Trauma Clinic. The large Sunto display on his wrist read 0755, five minutes early, spot on. And he knew they'd start on time. His therapist, Dr. Green, had been ready at 8 a.m. sharp every one of the last 10 Tuesday mornings. Americans were punctual like that. They didn't waste your time. He could do the hours session, jump back in the car, and be at work in Putney by 9.15 if he was lucky. Nice one. Reaching the large wooden front door, he saw that it was off the latch. That was unusual. He listened and over the antiquated heating that rumbled like a tractor engine, thought he could hear Dr. Green's deep, soft voice coming from the reception in calm, hushed tones. He gave the door a cautious push and it swung open soundlessly. Then he froze. Lexi Green was facing him from the other side of the large waiting area, her hands raised, palms open. Shielded behind her were two more clinic staff, another psychologist who Lockhart knew was called Dr. Edwards and the administrator, Maureen. All three of them were staring at the man in front of Green. He was an older guy, maybe 60, with thin gray hair combed across a bald patch that gleamed under the strip lighting. About 5'10", 12 stone. He wore a tracksuit and his right arm was extended towards Green. Lockhart crept over the threshold and sideways to get a better view. The guy was holding out a 12-inch black-handled kitchen knife. It was raised, shaking slightly, the tip of its massive blade so close to Green's neck that Lockhart saw it catch briefly on the skin of her throat. Her eyes flicked to him in a split second of recognition, 
but she returned her attention immediately to the man threatening her. None of you move, barked the guy. No alarms, yeah? Was he a criminal off the street, a drug user looking for a fix, or a patient who'd wandered in from one of the hospital's secure psychiatric wards? Is aggression simply the result of anxiety and disorientation? Lockhart couldn't tell, and right now, it didn't really matter. The most important thing was the knife about an inch away from Green's throat. It's okay, she responded gently. It's all right. Lockhart was absolutely still. The guy hadn't heard him come in over the noise of the heating. He slowed his breathing, feeling in his trouser pocket for the Leatherman multi-tool he always carried with its own blade tucked away, just in case. He scanned the room, another exit to Green's left through the reception, a lampstand he could use as a weapon, a fire alarm on the far wall, none of it accessible without giving himself away. Slowly, carefully, he eased the door to behind him. He'd have to deal with the situation here and now. One option was to try a 999 call from his coat pocket, knowing that if he subsequently pressed 55 on the keypad without saying anything, a police car would be dispatched to his location straight away. Could he be sure of hitting five twice on the touch screen though? It wasn't like in the old days with actual buttons you could feel, and it would take too long. Second option was to stealth his way up behind the guy and tackle him, controlling the knife and allowing Green to push the alarm and get out. But that was risky. The third option would be to create a distraction and hope that, delivery! The door behind him flew open and Lockhart instinctively dodged as the heavy wood came at him. The knifeman looked over his shoulder towards the postal worker in the doorway. Each as startled as the other, Lockhart knew this was the moment. The knife was six strides away, he reckoned. Lockhart had taken three before there was a blur of movement. Green's hand shot out and grabbed her assailant's wrist, turning it as her other hand swept across, breaking his grip and pulling the handle towards her. The whole sequence took less than a second, and by the time Lockhart reached them, Green was holding the knife. She was breathing heavily, but she was in control. She took a swift step away as Lockhart closed in on the guy, pulling his arm behind his back and bending his wrist up. But without his weapon, the attacker's energy seemed to be gone, and after a few seconds' struggle, he stopped resisting and Lockhart maneuvered him to the wall. He glanced across at Green and nodded. She nodded back, still clutching the knife. I'll call security, said Maureen. That's the second time this month. That's the end of my reading. Thank you very much for listening. And Knock Knock is available now on Amazon. Thanks very much. And thank you very much, Chris. I've got two questions popped up for you while um, you were reading there. So Alex Hawley would like to know, um, given the online nature of the world at the moment, do you think this will influence many books in the future? Or do you think authors would like to avoid it? <laughs> um, very good question. Well, I think, um, obviously, we, we're living more online now than we ever have, probably. And I think that's going to be reflected in, particularly in crime fiction, where the online world gives people all kinds of opportunities for committing crime, um, but also new forensic angles as well. Uh, although personally, I quite like a bit more kind of old school, real life uh, stuff where possible um, to keep that in the books and um, keep that alive. But yeah, it's, it's increasing and it's uh, impossible to get away from. Thank you. Um, and we've got a question from um, one of our writers who appeared on the very first virtual noir at the bar, Philippa East, who says, thanks so much, Chris, fab reading. Can I ask, do you still work as a clinical psychologist because she's a CP too? Oh, thanks very much. Um, uh, well, I'm still a clinical psychologist. I'm still on the register, but I don't do any clinical uh, work at the moment. I actually left the NHS uh, a couple of years ago, um, but I continue to, to work as a psychologist, so, but mostly doing consulting. And I try as much as possible to bring my knowledge of psychology and my experiences uh, when I was in the NHS um, into the writing um, and into the books and uh, really give it some kind of depth and some authenticity because there are incredible stories that I heard uh, when I was doing that work. And um, uh, it's a lot of inspiration for, for crime fiction. Great, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Okay, everyone. So um, we've had Louise Mangos, Martin Taylor and Chris Merritt. It's time to go and top your drinks up. We will have the wonderful Simon, who you never see, but you might see in a few weeks, um, has actually come up with a quiz for you this week during the break. Don't forget, if you want to be entered into the draw to win um, a free book, please email that email address right there. And if you are talking about us on social media, please use that hashtag right there. We will be back in about five minutes. Thank you very much, everyone.
Welcome back everyone. How did you do on the quiz? I've got to admit when I saw it, I did not do so well. <laughs> what can I say? Anyway, I think they've picked another name out of the house. Thank you everyone who's emailed me to win free books so far, but it is open until the end of the event. So please do feel free to pop your name over if you haven't already. Danny Marshall. Danny Marshall is from Halifax, a northern town which can boast three serial killers and some pretty dark stories, some of which are personal to Danny, but he says don't always make for uplifting anecdotes that fit nicely into an intro. So thank you for sparing us those, Dan Danny. Danny started off writing horror and in 2016 had a short story published in New Writing North's Northern Crime One compendium. Later that year, he was selected to pitch at Bloody Scotland, but unfortunately he had to go last straight after Alison Belsham, who, as many of you will know because she was with us at the first Virtual Noir at the Bar, has her third book out this year, so you can guess how it went for Danny. Writing paused for a while thanks to the arrival of Danny's first child, but after a period of being mentored by the wonderful Mary Hannah, he started writing again, winning a Northern Writers Award in 2018. Ooh, still can't hear you. Um, and he signed with an agency last year also. His first novel, Anthrax Island, is currently out on submission. So everybody, please give a huge round of applause to Danny Young. Not Danny Young, Danny Marshall. Hey, right, come on. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Yeah, so I, I wrote a, a locked room mystery set on a remote Scottish island and it, it did get me an agent last year. It's currently out on submission to publishers. So I was going to do a reading from that, but I thought a novel that takes place in an airtight military base on a lethally contaminated island with everyone running around in hazmat suits will probably now never see the light of day thanks to 2020. So I wrote another. Um, it's a thriller set on Dartmoor and I sent it to my agent just this weekend. So I thought I'd do a reading from that instead. It's called Down in the Park. Uh, starts off being about a bank heist in a tiny seaside village in Devon, but ends up being about something different entirely. And it follows Abbey, uh, a getaway driver. The section is part way in and there's a chapter break in between, but I'm sure you'll figure it out. And just before I start, it's rated 18 if you want to turn your headset off for excessively bad language and a frozen corpse. Um, <clears throat> they dragged the freezer up from the water's edge into the safety of the trees. This time of night they were the only people for miles, but Abby couldn't tear her eyes off the pines bending in the wind over the other side of the reservoir, the road beneath it winding back to the village. The fox's shriek echoed over the water. Abby pulled the collar of her coat tight. Rob rolled the freezer upside down, bending the lid back, then climbed on top, jumping up and down. There was a thud as the frozen corpse detached and dropped to the dirt. He rolled the freezer away. Abby shivered. The body of Kevin Medway lay on its back, frost glowing in the moonlight, still huddled, fingers frozen like claws. No visible injuries, which kind of made it worse. He looked like a long dead Arctic explorer, a picture of a body on Everest except wearing a suit. His face was still contorted in a snarl, and knowing what she knew now, Abby could well believe the bank manager had attacked Rob. She pulled out an iPhone, tapped the screen to wake it up, and held it over Medway's face. Come on, come on, come on. The logo spun and asked for the passcode instead. It's the ice, said Rob. He pulled his coat sleeve over his hand and started swiping away the frost. Abby tapped the phone and held it up again. Please enter the passcode. Shite, she said. His eyes need to be open. Rob poked his eyelid. It's frozen stiff. We'll not snap it off. We'll never unlock his phone. We have to defrost sausages for hours. We've got to find this guy now, tonight. Abby swore under her breath and looked round. We need to thaw him out. Get him in the car. Rob rested his shotgun on the corpse, grabbing under his armpits. Abby took his feet and shuffled forward, spitting pine needles as branches slapped her in the face, raking her cheeks and clawing her hair. After a couple of breathers and a ton of swearing, they eventually reached the road, finding Abby's old Audi Quattro tucked tight into the shadows. Propping Medway by the wheel, Abby opened the passenger door. She crouched and took his shoes. Whoa, 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 stick him in the back, said Rob. No, he's all crumpled and frozen, he's not gonna fit. She bent the seat forward to demonstrate the slim gap. Fine, he sighed and grabbed the arms and together they wedged the corpse into the passenger seat. Rob walked around the car, threw his shotgun in the back, climbed in after it. Abby dropped the seat back. Comfy? She gunned the engine, 
turn the heater up full, pointing the air vents straight at Medway's face. It's too noisy. Well, we need to drive to warm up the car. Driving around Dartmoor with a corpse in the passenger seat is definitely not a good look. She flicked the sun visor down and reached in the centre console, pulled out a pair of Ray-Bans, positioned them on his face. Is that better? Hang on, Rob clicked his seatbelt on. She put it in gear and pulled out from under the trees, accelerating up the hill back onto the high moors. Abby put the chocolate bars on the counter. 20 Embassy number one, please. The guy behind the counter sighed, put his phone down, scanning the bars. Designated driver. She looked across the forecourt at Rob fidgeting in the back of the car. In the passenger seat, Medway had slumped, curled up, fogging the side window where he was leant against it. His glasses had slipped and in the light under the canopy, his face was clearly visible. Yeah, big night. The attendant looked at his watch. Yeah, not that big. I hate when my mum picks me up. 52.76. Oh, I'm not his mum, you cheeky shit. Smoking ages, you skid. He put the cigs down next to the chocolate bars. She pushed the tongue into her cheek <clears throat> and held her breath. He was staring at her. She pulled a roll of 20s and slammed three on the counter. Where do I know you from? She looked around, panicking. The newspapers were stacked by the door, but her face wasn't across them yet. They'd only robbed the bank that morning, and she'd been on the news. She winked and leaned on the counter. Maybe you watch a lot of films. His face lit up. I knew it. Were you the actress when you were younger? Oh, fuck off. She tossed the chocolate and cigs in a passenger footwell and accelerated away, unable to keep the speed down. Did you get my Maltesers? said Rob. Fuck your Maltesers. Christ, we'd rob the bank next week if I'd have known it were your time of the month. Abby slammed the brakes, slid the car 90 degrees into a side road. Rob cracked his head against the window, swearing loudly. Medway rolled across the passenger seat. She flipped the wheel the other way, dropping in a second. All four wheels screeching in protest as she drifted across a junction. Rob leaned the other way, seatbelt digging into his neck. Fucking hell, let's get there in one piece. Where are we going anyway? She leaned over and pushed Medway back against the window. There's a building site down here. The five-cylinder engine snarled, turbo whined and fluttered, a crack of flame with every gear change. Above it, she could hear Rob snapping and closing a shotgun behind her. Suddenly, she didn't want to be somewhere so isolated. His stupidity rivaled only by his impulsiveness. How long before Rob decided he didn't need her anymore? Probably right up until she smelled the money. She tapped the brakes, the tyres chirped, off the road, crashing through steel fencing, padlocked between huge lichen-spotted gateposts. The original wrought iron gates hung either side, half buried in ivy and mud, ornate carved stone bars toppled and broken, the ancestral crest of some long-forgotten family. The Audi sped along an avenue of enormous ancient trees, skeletal arms reaching and greeting, a sombre canopy over the road, flashing between the twisting branches straight off the Hammer Horror film set. Menacing turrets and an old hall loomed dark against the clouds. The driveway opened onto a parking area full of excavators and metal shipping containers. Placards advertising new luxury apartments spinning and slamming against scaffolding. Abby thought it was a travesty to slice up the old hall into holiday homes for city types, but then again, probably seemed a travesty for some Victorian baronet to rebuild his ancestral manor into a gothic revival monstrosity. She drove round the old coach house and stables, up onto the wild grass, across weed-strewn flower beds, slid the car to a stop round the back of the house, out of sight of the road, next to a line of wizened old yew trees, forming a wide alley from the house up onto the high moor. They'd grown wild of neglect, all tall and twisted, dead branches of decay. A long, low moan swept down from the moor. A distant howl of some nocturnal beast, or maybe just the wind whistling through the yews. Either way, Abby shivered. She leaned over and pulled Medway upright in the seat, prodded his cheek. It yielded like Play-Doh. Just do it, said Rob. She looked at him in the rearview mirror. Fuck you, Rob, I've done everything today. He ducked from view, reappearing a few seconds later, tongue all over his gums, more white powder clinging to the stubble above his lip. It's like ripping off a plaster. He unclipped his belt, leaned forward and pushed Medway's eye open. The lid drooped back down again slowly. Get the phone ready. Hang on. Abby got out of the car and ran round the passenger side, opening the door and leaning in. She fumbled in the glove box and pulled out a roll of sellotape. Go. She bit off a piece of tape as Rob pushed Medway's eyelid back up and stuck it to his forehead. Rob let go. It drooped but held, as if a drunk Kevin Medway was fighting to stay awake. Next one, she bit off a piece of tape. Rob manoeuvred the eyelid into position. She secured it and leaned in past him, pulling out the phone, pointing it at his face. Light burst across the screen as it unlocked. You fucking dancer, yelled Rob from the back seat. Abby slid up onto the bonnet. Let's see what he's got. Beside the standard icons, there was only one uploaded. 
internet messaging. There were a number of notifications. She opened it and dropped the phone. Fuck. What is it? She heaved but managed to keep most of her guts in. Saliva dripped onto the grass. She pulled her sleeve down, wiped her eyes, reaching in for a six. Rob climbed out and picked up the phone, swiping through the messages while she tried to stop her hand shaking just long enough to flick a lighter. Holy shit, said Rob, this is fucked up. Abby took the cig away from her mouth and retched again. You were right, Rob said. There's a location on the messages. We can find the guy that took our money. Ab finally managed to get the cig lit in the wavering flame. It's not just about the money anymore, Rob. It is for me. Get back in the car. Rob, look at the pictures. We robbed a bank and killed the bank manager. <clears throat> we're not really in a position to judge. Not, not in a position. Jesus fucking Christ. She spun, jabbing the cigarette at Medway in the passenger seat. They're fucking serial killers. She saw Rob stood next to the open driver's door, phone in one hand, sawn off shotgun in the other, straight at her. Get back in the fucking car, Abby. Thank you. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, Danny, I'm actually going to come back to you, if that's okay. Um, because we have a question from Derek Farrell, who wants to know where he sends the bill for um, damaged hardware, because um, when you said, <laughs> fuck your Maltesers, he then <laughs> sprayed Rioja all over his monitor, and he also feels it should be on a t-shirt. Broadfoot has then uh, weighed in to say it should also be a hashtag. So I think we're going to get that going. We'll go with that. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think there was a disclaimer that I put out for swearing and any Maltesers. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, to be honest, yeah. Champion, thank you so much. That was brilliant. Thank you. Okay. I, yeah, I'm just speechless. What a pro. Um, that was brilliant. So next is Githa Lodge. I've got a little story to tell you about Githa before I, um, before I introduce her. I suspect she's possibly reading from the opening of her new book, Watching from the Dark. If she is, I'll probably be better telling you the story afterwards, actually, because I don't want to spoil anything. So anyway, Githa Lodge is the Sunday Times top 10 best-selling author of She Lies in Wait and Watching from the Dark. Her debut novel was picked for the Richard and Judy Book Club. Ooh! Wait, I think I might have heard it there. Um, and was a Sunday Times and New York Times crime pick and a top 11 bestseller in Germany which Githa thinks should be a thing, and I think it is a thing. So Githa, you're golden, it's fine. She is a single mum, weekend rowing coach and crossword nut, and has been known to fly into a rage when there is no tea when there should be tea. Um, so that's why we're friends. Also, I stalked her at Harrogate a couple of years ago, and, um, you know, we're just chums now. So I think she's just kind of got Stockholm Syndrome and things like, just go along with it, it'll be easier. So anyway... Big round of applause, please, for Githa Lodge. Hi, everyone. I, I've realised about two minutes ago that I'm breaking the one rule of TV and wearing stripes. So if anyone's eyes are going a bit funny, I hear it's better, actually, to listen to me with your eyes closed anyway. So we're fine. We're fine. So I'm going to read a little bit out of Watching from the Dark, which is my second book. Uh, they're a series, but they also work as standalones, or at least I've tried very hard to make sure they work as standalones. Both of them are crime, and both of them feature DCI Jonah Sheens and his team. So, watching from the dark. Something clicked in the house, and he froze, looking towards the closed door, his heart racing. Had it been the front door? Had someone come in? Aidan turned his head, straining to hear more. A footstep, rustling sounds of movement. But there was nothing. It was just the sound of something contracting somewhere, the normal ticking of the house. He tried to breathe out some of the tension. He'd been looking forward to this evening all week. He was, for once, free and unhampered, and had imagined a whole evening with Zoe. But of course, that wasn't how it had panned out. He might be free, but Zoe still had her own schedule, he was back to waiting for 11 o'clock, as he'd done every other Thursday. Instead of settling into a film on the sofa, he ended up hunkered over the desktop PC, checking Zoe's Skype icon for the moment she turned her machine on. But it had stayed resolutely red, 
and he'd wasted hours scrolling through news feeds and reading articles between checks. He'd spent so many nights like this, waiting for Zoe to come online. Half the time she was late, too. At first he'd been sulky about it, until he'd learned that sulking made her rebellious. She needed to feel free. So he'd had to learn to accept that he would see her when he saw her, that he wasn't the only one who had a busy life to work round. At 10.52, Zoe's icon finally turned green. It took him no more than a second to click on it and connect. The pickup was instant and he was already smiling in anticipation before the image appeared. But then he saw that Zoe's chair was empty. She was off camera, with only a moving shadow thrown on the wall, evidence that she was there at all. What was she doing? He turned up the volume on his speaker and realised he could hear running water. Was she about to take a bath? Now? He felt instinctively that this must be some sort of game. Like the times when she undressed for him, her gaze slightly distant and her lips very slightly apart. It drove him wild. But this was no game. He couldn't see her. Frustrated, he adjusted his own screen. Of course, it did nothing to the angle of the camera in her room. He could still only see the empty chair and beyond it the wall, with a slice of curtain to one side and the hinges of her front door on the other. The sound of the running water tapered and then ceased. There were other sounds of movement, the squeak of wet skin on plastic. Aidan sighed. She really was going to have a bath while he sat here and waited. He thought about hanging up in protest. But then, if she really was only going to be quick, he might miss seeing her naked, her body dripping with water, or her breasts barely held in by a towel as she leaned towards the camera and clicked on the mouse. And then there was a clicking sound. He saw movement and realised that it was the door to Zoe's flat. It was moving, the hinged edge that was, that was in, within his view swinging inwards. It was pure fear that hit him then. Had she asked another man over? Was she letting someone in to watch her bathe, perhaps to touch her, while he was forced to watch? He expected to hear the newcomer call out, but the door closed almost soundlessly. There was no greeting, no other sound. He reached out and turned the speaker up, almost in spite of himself. There was a slight buzzing and over the top of it, sounds of water as Zoe moved in the bath. It was only by straining to hear that he caught soft footsteps. Whoever had come in was moving across the room. A moment later, there was a sound of sudden movement from the bath, and Zoe's voice raised in surprise. What? What are you... And there was a tight laugh. Look, I... I'm really sorry. The water sounds dropped away with a click. Whoever had come in had closed the door. There was another click, picked up by the microphone, and his heart rate was back up again. Had he been right? Was she seeing someone else? But then there were other sounds, sounds that were unmistakably the result of a struggle. Zoe's voice, muffled, sounded hoarse and desperate. And then, abruptly, there was silence. Absolute silence. The fear was different now. Something was very, very wrong. Aidan had to do something. He had to help her. But, oh God, what if he was too late? He scrabbled around at the desk until he found his phone. He'd started to dial three nines when the realisation of what this meant hit him, and he stalled. He could see it all. The phone call, the follow-up, being asked in to see the police. Everything finally coming out, and his life coming crumbling down. He heard the bath and door click once again. Soft footsteps. The same quiet, even sounds, and then scuffling that he couldn't make sense of. He willed them to come into the frame, to show their face. But the steps continued, and the door to the flat moved again. The figure he had never seen left the room, and the door clicked shut. Thank you. Thanks, Githa. I'm going to stay with you for a second, because Alex Hawley would like to know. Um, he says he'd really, oh, sorry, Alex, maybe he or she, my apologies, Alex, really enjoyed the first two books. Could you please tell us when book three will be out? Oh, I like that question. Excellent. <laughs> I'm seriously excited for book three. Um, it's out in the spring and I've heard nothing to say that that's going to change at all. So that's good news so far. 
um, and I really can't wait. Of the three books so far, it's my favourite concept. Um, but uh, Stevens, at the moment, I want you all to read books one and two. I probably shouldn't talk about that and confuse the issue. Um, but yes, so not not too long to wait. And I have a question, actually. How did it feel when you found out you were going to be part of Richard and Judy's book club? Oh, it was amazing. It was it was really really amazing. I think. Um, I had by that point decided that it wasn't going to happen because they'd sort of put the submissions in and actually um, I had this weird situation where uh, they'd already kind of decided who they wanted for, for sort of that season and then they, uh, interesting insight how this works, they then said actually that they'd really like to um, include me in the next batch. Um, so uh, it, it actually meant that we uh, somewhat shifted publication date and uh, I was happy to wait because it meant that I got to be part of it and actually going to meet them and sit and um, chat the book through them with them was one of the best experiences ever. It was really cool. And yeah, they were so interested and engaged that that made it a real, real treat. Excellent. Everybody, thank you. Get the lodge. Fab. Um, so the story I was going to tell you before, but didn't want to ruin things. Basically, earlier, we have a little chat before we come live to your homes. And um, Getha appeared and then disappeared and just left her webcam on. And um, Trevor Wood and I were a bit like, oh, she's not reenacting the opening of the book, is she? Like, do we need to be worried? Is she okay? She is okay. She's more than okay. She's fantastic. So um, thank you for that, Getha. That was great. <laughs> Next we have... Merrill. Effie Merrill is a writer from the Northeast. She has had many short stories published and she wrote her sort of autobiographical fiction, um, Confessions of an Undercover Cop, under the name Ash Cameron. And that was published by Harper Collins. Um, Effie Merrill won the first Bloody Scotland Pitch Perfect in 2013. Woo! But life sort of got in the way. She is now back and on the road to writing this novel, She's Not There, as F.E. Birch. Tonight, she is reading about Detective Cat Wallace, a character in the book who she first wrote about in, her, in 2004 in her novel that she currently has stored under the bed, Baby Mama. So everybody, Effie Merrill. Hi. Can you hear me? Um... This story has to come with a warning. There's a few swears in it. Um, the topic is about a baby death. So I'm really sorry. I don't want to offend anybody. If it's something that you don't really wish to hear, please mute me. Um, I won't be offended. And I hope I don't offend anybody. It's when you wake and pause. That time when your mouth is dry and the tongue sticks temporarily to the top of your mouth. And you cough <coughs> a little to clear your throat and phlegm catches. That slight moment when your prize open an eye and last night's smudged mascara flakes from your sleep-filled lashes and you resist the urge to rub as your vision is an altered and blurry view of the bedside table. It's then, that tiny sliver of time, the moment between waking and reality hitting you hard, that you realise with a painful thud that it's true after all and not a dream or a nightmare from which you could struggle to wake, but there in front of you, and you wish you could go back to thinking it was a trick of the mind whilst you slept. And then that's when you know that it's real and it begins all over again. They rang in the middle of the night. Disorientated, I reached for the phone and I didn't have time for that moment to kick in. He's dead. He's dead. It echoed and bounced around the dark corners of my head as I made my way to the office on the top floor of the police station. First one in before the cleaners. Only the night shift cops skulking in corners. On automatic I made coffee, pouring in half a packet of dark strong roast. I opened the slatted blinds to let in the frosted early sunlight. And as I looked out of the window and past the chimneys and the spires and the old architectured rooftops, the glint of the distant sea speckled, defying the chill of the early morning. It would be another two hours before the station came alive. I could stand and look at the view forever, watching the town unfold and come away, alive, not dead like the cynics called it, but buzzing, bright, alive and vibrant. For an old, cold northern town, it's grim up north, they say. They know nothing, brothers grim, because this is no fairy tale. I completed the paperwork, sipped dark coffee, same forms, different names. I faxed, because we still have to use the fax, the bundle across to the coroner's office so they would have it by the time the first person arrived just after eight. The dozen pages printed on slippery smudged paper would lie half on the floor, upside down and scattered, 
some fallen and toppled over and a couple into the waste bin no one thinks to move. The last sheet would be dangling by the margin as it hung from the machine with metal grippers, refusing to give it up. But that wasn't my problem. I had known there would be trouble and I could smell it like a cliche because 23 years of training on the job isn't wasted. It never is when you're dealing in kiddie death for a trade. And that's the ultimate, the worst, the grim reaper of social work, police work of public service. For some reason, I decided to call around that day. No other reason than just that urge. I had intended to be there by 10, but was delayed by a phone call from the Crown Court. The judge wanted some detailed information about some convicted paedophile, and he was looking at life this time, so they needed to get it right. The lack of information wasn't the computer's fault, it was human error. The result of some eager to make his mark over promoted chief who decided they should keep information for more than, shouldn't keep information for more than three years. Another flawed policy, general information useless. Information about someone wanting to phone 999 asking for a plumber and not a policeman was fair enough to consign to the recycle bin, but not the nitty gritty down and dirty methods of a child groomer. So I gave the court clerk the best of my memory and I never ever forget my cases or their faces. They flicked in front of me and bidding like a dealer shuffling and turning each card, flick, flick, flick. It was nearly two by the time I arrived, unexpected, unbidden, unwanted, and they weren't going to let me in. Tasha stood behind a man with shy cow eyes and a nervous twitch of a mouth. Imperceptible signs, but it raised the hairs on the back of my neck and I just knew. His eyes were glazed and I knew it hadn't been long since his last talk. What do you want? He rolled his eyes with his words. Just to see how you're doing after last week, I smiled. Well, you see, now you can piss off. He moved close to the door, but my foot was already there. I could see the carpet still had the grime and the dust and the dirt from my previous visit. Just a routine follow-up, I've got some news. Can I come in? You don't want the neighbours nebbing, eh? He grunted and moved back, and she stepped behind him as if connected by invisible elastic or a fishing line. She was hooked, like just like they all were. The insecure beaten girlfriend of the local thugs, junkies and no-hopers who lived in and around the estate. All they wanted was someone to love and to be loved back, all anyone wants. I'd visited the house last week with the social worker. Tasha's brother had taken a bad trip and collapsed in the street and been rushed to hospital. They'd resuscitated him, all right. A bad batch of heroin was flying around and five people had died. Society's justice, my boss called it. I wasn't so cruel. Tasha's brother had his four-year-old daughter with him and she needed a place of safety because her mother was miles away in Glasgow. We found Tasha's address complete with her own drug addicted partner and baby. We didn't leave the young girl. Something was wrong. No gut feelings, no instinct, because the old Bill don't believe in that these days. The evidence has to speak for itself. But all too often, that evidence is subliminal. It's more than a dirty house. A smelly house. A house that needs a good scrub. The baby mattress on the floor, the mouse droppings in the corner of the kitchen, the tiny ripped up bits of silver paper trodden in the dirt ground worn off pattern carpet. It's more than the lack of telephone, the torn up fag ends, the candles worn down at the wick with wax with the drips, drips, drips down the windowsill, down the wall, pooling at the edge where the skirt and board meets the worn fabric. The baby bottle in the corner of the room growing mould, the knotted hair at the back of baby mama's head, the tiny drop of red on the tiny on the dirty bare floorboards in the spare room. It's all of that and more. The lack of eye contact, the defensive body language, the way the baby looks at nothing with his blank vision and he doesn't cry. It's not the obvious things you can relate to a jury to make them believe you when you say that you know that there's something wrong. It's not the call to the police from a concerned relative telling you a baby has left home alone, unattended, unwanted. It's not the bruising on the inside of the feet of a child who cannot yet walk and you don't find until post-mortem. It's all of those things that come later. It's the here and the now and the knowledge and experience that all of those things tell you and would be missed oblivious to an untrained eye. He opened the door wider and I slipped in. Not to the kitchen, never discuss anything in the kitchen. I walked through to the living room, the cluttered, too warm, sickly, sweet-smelling living room. What's the news then? He asked, clenched hands plunged into his jean pockets, knuckles poised, punching the insides of the strained material, moved one foot to the other. Tasha remained half behind him, blinking too fast, saying nothing like a wild animal in the traps. Oh, there'll be no charges for you, brother, I said, looking at her. No offence of being drugged up in charge of a child, only if you're drunk, CPS won't run with neglect. 
I wasn't sure if they understood what I was saying, nor tried to make it simple. No charges? He nearly fucking died, he snarled at me. That mean he can have his kid back? Well, she's back with her mum, it's up to her, I shrugged. I guess she would let him when it came to Saturday night and she had no babysitter. She'd let him when she decided she wanted a break and her mother wouldn't look after her three kids under five. She'd let him if and when it suited her, no matter what social services said. I just came to tell you, that's all. So how's Luke? All right, why? I could have phoned, I could have asked the social worker to pass on the message and I could have done any number of things, but I didn't. I just knew I had to see that little boy. Routine welfare check, nothing else. I smiled and looked at my watch, deliberate, trying to make me think and I was in a hurry, trying to get somewhere else, making me think I wasn't a threat. Tasha answered. He's sleeping? Tiny mouse voice, too high, too nervous. Just a peek then, I said, smiling at her this time. Then I'll be off, leave you to it. She pointed over behind the arm of the worn settee. He's over there. He filled the tattered Moses basket, his inert body covered with a grey-white cellular blanket up to his chin. His white skin, the lack of little breaths. He was still, motionless. My heart pounded in the back of my dry throat as I put a hand out to his chest. I felt his tiny wrist. It was faint, but his heart was beating. I called for the ambulance. He lay on the hospital bed linked up to apparatus and I hoped that he would die and I know that sounds cruel and callous but I'd seen close up too many times the after effects of shaken baby. Severe brain damage, no walking or talking or feeding, confined to a wheelchair with restricted movements, a globule of drool, a crooked smile and sad eyes. A lifetime in an institution whilst mummy and daddy stay rent free in a majesty's pleasure serving sentences that won't ever make up time for the life lost, should either or both be convicted of course. A neighbour had seen him happily gurgling in his pram at nine o'clock that morning, and if only I'd got there earlier, maybe I could have prevented it, somehow, perhaps. Now it's too late. And when I go to bed tonight, his presence will add to the others. As I curl my back to the empty space to the other side of me, I feel him like I feel the others, unexplained, unexpected, dead. And every day I carry the pain as a burden. And it's when you wake and pause and that time when your mouth is dry and your tongue sticks temporarily to the top of your mouth and, and you do everything you can to stop it from happening again. Done. Thank you very much for that. Um, that was really powerful. Um, thank you. Okay, our final reader um, for this part is Eve Smith. Um, Eve Smith is a Southern Jessie from Oxfordshire who writes speculative fiction, mainly about things that scare her. In this world of questionable facts, stats and news, she believes that storytelling is vital to engage people in real life issues. Her debut novel, The Waiting Rooms, which was launched last week on ebook, so get yourself to your ebook. Uh, store of choice and download it now was shortlisted for the Bridport Prize First Novel Award. Ooh. Her flash fiction has been shortlisted for the Bath Flash Fiction Award Ooh. and highly commended for the Brighton Prize. I can definitely hear you women now for sure and rightly so. Um, Eve's previous job as COO of an environmental charity took her to research projects across Asia, Africa and the Americas and she has an ongoing passion for wild creatures, wild science and far-flung places. A modern languages graduate from Oxford, I'm sorry but woo, she returned to the wilds of West Oxfordshire 15 years ago to set up home with her family. So everybody, I'm so delighted that she's um, decided to spend our Wednesday evening with us, Eve Smith. <laughs> oh, thanks so much, Vic and Simon as well. Can you hear me okay? Hopefully, good, excellent. Um, so I'm going to be reading from The Waiting Rooms um, and I need to give a little warning um, that if you've had enough of disease and death at the moment, you may want to go for a protracted toilet break um, because uh, I'm just going to give you a little bit of context so you know what you're letting yourselves in for. Um, so decades of spiralling drug resistance have unleashed a global antibiotic crisis. Ordinary infections are untreatable and a scratch from a pet can kill. A sacrifice is required to keep the majority safe 
no one over 70 is allowed new antibiotics. The elderly are sent to hospitals nicknamed the waiting rooms, hospitals where no one gets well. So um, we catch up with Kate, a nurse, in chapter one. Room 15. My fingers hover over the handle. There's no noise from within, only the faint hum of air filters. I push my hair back behind my ears and adjust my collar. I take one more breath and go in. There's just the two of them. He's by the sofa and she's by the window. The room smells of perfume and sweat. She's late forties, I'd say, maybe a little older. All kitted out in designer skirt, jacket and heels, her hair scraped back in a tight bun. Mr and Mrs Atkinson, I'm Kate Connolly, Ward's sister. I raise my palm, the now customary greeting. Pleased to meet you. No one touches each other's hands anymore, not unless they're intimate. She dabs at her swollen grey eyes with a white cotton handkerchief that is clenched in one fist. She doesn't return the greeting. The husband steps forward, sneaking his phone back into his pocket. His thick brown hair is just about keeping the grey at bay around the edges. Roy, Roy Atkinson. He nods his head as if he's at some kind of business meeting. Sorry to keep you waiting, I say. I'm sure you understand. We have to put the patients first. She gives a strangled snort. He shoots her a look. It's the sort of look I get from Mark sometimes. Before we get started, would you like another drink? I say. I could organize more coffee or something cold, perhaps. She reels round. I'm here for an assisted dying, not bloody afternoon tea. I don't respond. It's best to leave the anger there hanging. Let them enjoy it or regret it before you move on. Sorry, he whispers, his eyes scurrying past my face. She's just, you know, very upset. Of course, I understand. I indicate the sofa. Shall we sit? I'm praying, he says yes. He hesitates and takes a seat. She remains standing. A painted thumbnail digs into the web of skin between her left thumb and forefinger. It's already raw. Soon it will start to bleed. I'm here to answer your questions. I address her first and then him, to support you in any way I can while respecting your father's wishes. I understand you received the notification this morning. He looks at her, but she is silent. He runs his tongue over his lips. Yes, that's right. He has nice eyes, I think, a deep turquoise like the Alberon Sea, our last holiday before they shut the borders. He stares at his feet and frowns as if he's just trodden in something. My wife and I, we don't want, I mean, we don't believe it's necessary to make that level of decision at this stage. She is watching me, waiting for me to speak. I don't. What I'm trying to say is, well, we feel this is all very sudden. There must be options. He sighs, his pockets of words already dwindling. I mean, he must still be in shock. He can't be thinking straight. I make my move. Mr. and Mrs. Atkinson, I keep my voice soft and slow. I understand how difficult this is, but your father has thought this through. He's, it's not an impulsive reaction to his latest results. He's in pain, a lot of pain. He's been preparing for this for a long time. She erupts. It's his prostate, for Christ's sake. He's only 73. Surely there's something you can do. She has broken the skin. A dark line of blood gathers in the crease. I turn to her. Your father's cancer is advanced. His tumor is what we call T4. That means it has spread beyond the prostate and is affecting his other organs. His Gleason score is nine, which means it is a high grade, fast growing cancer. Her eyes are fixed on me, jaw clenched tight as if she's battling to hold her tongue. He's no longer responding to hormone therapy. The longer we leave it, the further it will spread. I don't understand, says the husband. What about radiotherapy, or at least a blast of chemo? I thought they were still eligible for some procedures. Even a mild course of chemotherapy would have serious consequences. He looks at me like a confused child, mouth agape. 
People just don't get it, no matter how many times they're told. It's as if they think we're making it up. All cancer treatments increase the risk of an infection, I say, trying to be kind. Chemotherapy depresses the immune system. Radiotherapy kills healthy cells as well as bad ones. Surgery opens up patients to all kinds of bacteria. Your father would end up going through considerable pain and discomfort, including some highly unpleasant side effects for no benefit. Without effective antibiotics, these treatments simply won't work. Tears spill onto her cheeks and carve their way down to her chin. I think of pen and my chest constricts. This is too soon, much too soon. I shouldn't have agreed to come. I understand how hard this is, I say, but your father doesn't want things to be drawn out. I swallow, you have to let him make his choice. She buries her face in her hands. The husband tentatively wraps his arms around her as if she might break. I feel sorry for her, of course I do, but these people mistake their passionate pleas for love. It isn't, it's their own grief getting in the way. You were aware of his intentions, I say to them. You were both witnesses to his directive. Yes, yes we were, he gives me a desperate look. But that was a long time ago and, well, we never thought that, we never imagined that he'd actually ever have to. His voice trails off. It's like a swear word, dying. Some people just can't say it. She steps away from her husband. A wisp of hair has escaped from her bun. She claws it back behind her ear. Convenient, isn't it? At first, I think it's her husband she's speaking to. Patients shipping themselves off, unblocking those beds. Her words sound swollen. You have targets, I suppose. Helen, please. He draws in a long, staggered breath. I glance at the clock and brace myself for the next stage of this meeting. Mrs. Atkinson casts her eyes around the room. She gazes at me with an intensity that's all too familiar. We're wealthy, you know, she whispers. We have money. He shakes his head. Helen, don't. She thrusts her hand in her bag and starts tearing through it. We can pay. She brandishes a burgundy leather purse with gold buckles. We can give you whatever it takes. Stop it. Her husband snatches it from her. You're just making things worse. Mrs. Atkinson, I say, stepping back. I'm sorry, that's not only illegal, it's not even possible. I know it happens. You look after your own, don't you? Her voice slices through the room. I've read the stories, I bet you'd do it if it was your own father. I don't know what you've read, but the truth is that the drugs simply aren't available. I slow things right down as we've been taught. We don't have access to them in this sort of hospital. None of them do. You're lying, she shouts. Why won't you help us? What is it? Don't we fit your criteria? Aren't we the right kind of people? I'm about to respond, but she cuts in. Is it you? Do you do it? Her breathing is quick and shallow. She has composed herself now, channeled her anger. I'm sorry? Do you kill them or does someone else? I hold her gaze. My pulse sounds amplified like Sasha's heartbeat all those years ago when I had my prenatal scans. My eyes flick up to the security camera and back again. If you're asking me whether I assist patients to end their lives, then the answer is Oh no! I can't believe we've just stopped there, Eve. We've lost you. Oh, I just, I genuinely can't believe it. I'm, I was, I was on the edge of my seat there as well. Well, that was a total cliffhanger. Um, so if you want to tweet about that, there's the hashtag. Um, <laughs> people are claiming this is marketing. I don't think it is, are they? Fair play to Eve if it is a market employee. Absolutely gripping. Thank you very much, Eve. I hope we'll, we'll get you back shortly. Um, if you want to work in a free book, email this um, 
this email address here. We're going to go for a five minute break and then, and then we'll be back for our final three readers. Thank you so much, everybody.
Welcome back everyone. I've had a message from Eve to say she's really, really sorry, but for whatever reason, um, she can't connect and come back to us. So I know you're all really disappointed. I know I am. Um, hopefully we'll get Eve back another time. We did have someone asking if um, there will be information with regard to where you can buy the books. So if you're on that cliffhanger with Eve, um, and also where you can follow these lovely, fantastic writers on Twitter. Um, our follow-up email comes out a couple of days after the event, and that will have all the information you need in terms of where to buy the books and where you can follow them on social media if you're not already. So I've given the hat of doom a shake. And our next victim is Rob Parker. My lovely, lovely friend Rob is the author of the Ben Bracken thrillers and the standalone post-Brexit country noir, Crook's Hollow. Rob enjoys a rural life on an old pig farm, now minus pigs, writing horrible things between school runs. Rob writes full time, as well as organising and attending various author events across the UK while boxing regularly for charity. Passionate about, about inspiring a love of the written word in young people, Rob spends a lot of time in schools across the Northwest encouraging literacy, storytelling, creative writing, and how good old fashioned hard work tends to help good things happen. Listen to your dad. Um, he's one third of the Blood Brothers podcast with M. Sean Coleman and Chris MacDonald, as well as being part of the Northern Crime Syndicate as well. And we'll be talking about that a little bit later on. Don't forget, if you've got any questions for our panelists, please do use the questions and answer button down at the bottom and I'll try to answer them. But for now, everybody, the lovely Rob Parker. Good evening, everybody. Um, right. Thank you very much to, uh, well, to everyone who's still here. Thank you very much, uh, Vic and Simon as well. What you guys do every week is unbelievable. Um, so I thought tonight I would read from the second Ben Bracken book, uh, which follows on immediately after, well, six months after, really, A Wanted Man. Um, and in this one, um, I'd like to read the prologue because um, it's, a, it's kind of more of the fun kind of... Um, I thought we could do something that would make us smile a little bit, a little hit of something that would get the endorphins going. So six months after the events of a wanted man, Ben Bracken is on the, um, well, he's in the Costa del Sol uh, doing things uh, for the NCA off the books. That's the National Crime Agency. Um, and um, yeah, he's hunting down unofficial targets on their behalf. So I'll dive straight into the prologue. <clears throat> there he is. My enemy, my target, my polar opposite. Leather skinned, red and blotchy, peels at the edges of his fleeing hairline like parchment. The luminous green drink he holds in his left hand, the heavy gold chain weighing down the wrist on the right. The sheer entitlement in his stance. The entire package makes me grimace. But somehow, I smile. The mere fact he is like this only makes things easier for me. I sit in a McDonald's, nursing a long melted McFlurry, peering through the plate glass windows out into 24 hours square. It's a malaise of excess in flip flops, a sweltering southern Spanish day having lazily made way for a humid evening. And with that, the neons of 24 hour square have blinked into life. The clubs line the square like so many anthills, sending their workers out to bring back recruits with the promise of cheap booze and girls. I've been hanging out in this place for a few days, blending in without too much trouble. Just another soul, hunting endorphins in pheromones. He takes her hand, and I know it's on. He walks her across the taxi rank, an urgent potter to his step, darting through the stop-start traffic in Kioma. She trots behind him in scuffed nights, which I felt when I met her was an odd choice for a street-corner prostitute. She throws a look back at her friends. I'm not sure if they actually are her friends or her mere acquaintances. They seem to look out for each other, but only to a point. It's all weary smiles and off-trod conversation until a trip comes along. Then that lucky girl is on her own. They're in a taxi in a flash, and with that I'm up and out the door. I know exactly where they're going, and I'll be there, waiting. He certainly laid it on thick. In the distance, the marinas of Torremolinos glow with promise before being swallowed abruptly by the darkness of the sea, 
while on the terrace table in front of him sits some pills, a baggie of cocaine and a bottle of red. From my spot on the patio roof, eight feet above him, I can see it's a Shiraz. What a smoothie. He sits there in his underpants, his wiry body and his pot belly, like a fat stick insect with a leer at full wattage. She's now in a swimsuit he had waiting for her. Come on, love, he says in a crackling cockney gargle. Do that dance you know I like. Do it right here. My teeth itch, hearing him talk like this. And Kyoma stands about a foot away from him and starts a half-hearted grind. Not that one, he says. The other one. The one that makes that arse jiggle. My fists are bald now. And Kyoma turns and shakes her rear at him rhythmically, near hopping up and down on the spot in a bored music video twerk. I feel voyeuristic and dirty, knowing I could stop this, and I'm just watching. But I need to learn. I need to know the signs. I need to know what makes these bastards tick. That's the one, he says, adjusting himself. He reaches out and smacks her backside, causing her to yelp, and he sighs in obvious delight. It's all foul. I hold fast as best as I can. He throws an arm round her waist and pulls her close before reaching for the pills, and I know I won't stand for that. I drop into their midst and land with the skill only my training could provide. She springs out the way and I'm on him in a heartbeat. He doesn't even have time to stand. I clamp the rubber clown mask over his face. It's the best I could come up with from the marketplace in Fuengarola earlier in the day. He struggles, but I hold him firm, pinning him into the seat with my hands against his elbows and a foot up into his swollen abdomen. The interior surfaces of the ill-fitting mask are covered with rags soaked in chloroform. Once it's over his head, like now, all I've got to do is keep him in place. His confusion will be massive and he's already losing his control. I turn sit on his belly while he slips away and face in Kyoma. We met yesterday. She's a beautiful, soulful young Nigerian who came here to find work, knowing full well, sadly, that the sex trade was her likely destination. She was prepared to take the risk that there might be another way. Now she's corrupted, warped and wayward, contorted by the demands of her industry. Yesterday I offered her a hot dog. She offered me a series of sexual options by way of gratitude each one more crude and carnal than the last. Our conversation today couldn't be more different. Thank you, she says. You're welcome. Do better for yourself in Kyoma, I say. I take the glass of red from the table and give it a sniff. It smells cheap and not necessarily cheerful, like a jockstrap full of old fruit. I'll try, she replies, grabbing her fallen clothes. She looks at the table with half a glance, but it's enough for me to catch it. I know the plight these girls face. For girls like these, drugs and booze become anchors in a sex trade storm. I'm realistic enough to know that my saving in Kyoma from one nasty trick isn't going to be enough to steer her away from addiction. Try harder, I say, before standing up briskly and sliding the table roughly to the edge of the balcony. And Kyoma just watches with sheepish futility as I hoist the whole lot up and over the railing, raining the booze and contraband down into the swimming pool below. She drops her eyes to the floor. On your way, I tell her, before looking back to my stricken prey. He's out for the camp, but his mask stares back at me. One of the rubber eyes has folded in on itself into a dark slit. He could be winking at me. Right back at you, Slick. You won't be harming anyone anymore. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that. Particularly loved the accents, gotta say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Right. Um, I think all of you will be really delighted to hear that Eve has joined us again. Thankfully, we've managed to get our broadband going again. We've got the hamster in the wheel. So without further ado, I welcome back Eve Smith. Very sorry about that, guys. Um, can you hear? Yes? Perfect. Right. I think we got to this part. How many? How many have you done? I pause, weighing honesty against diplomacy. Almost 20 years since the act was passed. It must be thousands. 
I'm not sure, I say eventually. I don't keep count. Her eyes widen as her heart husband darts between us. She shoves him aside. They should lock you up. Murder, that's what it is. You can dress it up with your fancy names, but it doesn't change what you're doing. Helen, that's enough. He grabs her by the arm. I can hear the feet already running down the cor corridor. She didn't mean that, he says, flushes of pink breaking out across his face. I'm so sorry, it's the grief talking. I swallow. Mrs. Atkinson, I know this is difficult, but if you wish to be present, you'll have to compose yourself. She breaks away from him and thrusts her finger in my face. You know where you're going? You're going to hell. What do you call this, I think. I look at her red, screwed up face, the mascara running down her cheeks. I used to rant like her. I used to beat my fists, but it doesn't do anyone any good. It doesn't change anything. That's it. <laughs> thank you so much and thank you for Thank you so much for that. And thank you for, for coming back and finishing. I know everybody was on tender hooks, although I don't know that you've seen this, but they did think it was a market employee. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you so much for, for coming back and, and finishing that. We're delighted. And I know lots of us can't wait to read it. So thank you very much. Okay. Um, there's two chaps left. I am slightly concerned about how inebriated each of them is now. Um, we'll just have to see how it goes. That's kind of one of the problems with Noir at the Bar. You never know how drunk someone's going to be when they come up and read. So, Trevor Wood. <laughs> You're not last. It's cool. Trevor Wood is a Newcastle-based writer whose debut novel, The Man on the Street, is about a homeless man, homeless man? Homeless man who sees a murder. It was published on March the 19th, just days before they closed all of the bookshops. And I was actually meant to be going to Trevor's launch in Newcastle um, the week that everything got really weird. And I believe on the day of the little party you were meant to have at Waterstones, Trevor, um, they said they couldn't do it and you ended up in a pub in Newcastle. Is that right? It is true. Yeah. So Trevor is kind of kind of the inspiration or part of the inspiration for virtual noir at the bar because what we're trying to do here is is ensure that we can have a little party for people whose books have come out during this insane time and who would probably have really great parties for us all to come to if if things weren't weird so um on the plus side um <laughs> trevor says he may well end up with the world record for the longest time, a debut novel has sat in the front window of Newcastle's Waterston. So, you know, he's an optimist and <laughs> he's remaining positive. The Man on the Street has been called an instant classic by Lee Child. Woo! And get this, has been optioned for TV by World Productions, makers of Line of Duty and Bodyguard. Woo! <laughs> so um, everybody, it is my delight to introduce you to Trevor Wood. Thanks very much, Vic. Um, thanks for inviting me. Uh, and thanks to Simon and Nikki behind the scenes for making all this work. Um, and a special thanks to the Brinkburn Brewery for delivering me a five litre keg of Quayside Blonde. Um, the man on the street is about a homeless man who sees a murder. Um, but the current day story is interspersed with very short chapters to show us how Jimmy, for that is his name, ended up on the streets uh, and I'm going to read one of those chapters. I like to dedicate this to my daughter who's trapped in Vancouver uh, because it's also short and quite sweary. Visiting room, Her Majesty's Prison, Durham, 1992. Jimmy stares at the door in the corner, waiting for Bev to come through. He's sitting on a chair in front of a small table, leaning forward, biting his nails. She's late. He can't wait to see her. Been inside for 16 months and it's only her third visit. He doesn't blame her. It's a long way to come. She can't drive and the public transport's shite. He hopes she brings Kate this time though. Wants to see how much she's grown, how much she's changed. There are about 20 other prisoners sitting at tables just like this. Most of them already talking to their visitors. 
heads as close together as the watching screws will allow. Keep your distance, a screw shouts, clapping his hands loudly when an inmate right in front of him gets a little too close to his missus. The outer door swings open and three more visitors are escorted in. And there she is, Bev. Hair cropped short, elf in style, lighter than he's ever seen it before. She looks stunning. No cake though. As she approaches the table, Jimmy stands up automatically, forgetting there are different rules here. Sit down, one of the screws shouts, or I'll take her straight back out again. Jimmy does as he's told, holding his hand up in apology. Doesn't want to mess things up again. She'd left early last time, upset that he lost his temper. They kept swearing, one of the bad habits he'd picked up inside. Bev gets to the table and sits down on the chair opposite, on the opposite side, her handbag on her lap. Hi, Jimmy says. You've lost weight, she says. Prison food, not quite like home cooking. How you doing? Fine, he says, can't complain, you? Fine. Silence, they're out of practice. How's Kate? Bev smiles for the first time. She's great, I love school, never wants to come home, truth be told. Jimmy tries to hold it back, but he can't. It bursts out of him like he's got Tourette's. I was hoping she'd be here. It's a school day, Jimmy, she's got school. It's only a fucking primary school, Bev. It's not like she's got exams next week. Jimmy, you, you, you promised. He's blown it already. She looks like she's gonna cry. She is crying. He reaches a hand across the desk. I, I'm sorry. Keep your distance, a screw shouts, banging his baton on an empty desk for emphasis. Jimmy pulls his hand back. Bev is staring down at her bag now, tears rolling down her cheeks. I'm sorry, Bev, he says, I, I just miss her, that's all. You'll be out in a year, she mumbles, still not looking at him. Silence again, he doesn't know how to tell her. She feels his hesitation and glances up at him. Jimmy, what is it? He has no choice. There was a fight in the dining hall. She's shaking her head now. I, I didn't start it, he says, knowing how pathetic that sounds, like something his dad would have belted him for. What are you saying? He, hesitate, he hesitates again, knowing she's not gonna like this. Probably have to do the full sentence. Five years, she says, he nods. But I've already done two, what with the time in remand and that. She's looking at her bag again. Maybe you could bring her next time? Silence again, unbearable fucking silence. Bev, he says. She looks up, looks at him properly for the first time. I've met someone else, she says. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Trevor. Always a pleasure to host you. Um, okay, before we find out who our found, final reader is, um, I'll just remind you, if you're looking to enter to win free books, please email this email address here. Um, our last reader this evening, it's only right, he was late to the party, so I, I didn't actually engineer it like this, but it has happened like this anyway. Neil Gordon. That. I say that, yeah, I do. <laughs> 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 Described by Ian Ranking as a true rising star of crime fiction, Ooh! Neil Broadford's debut novel, Falling Fast, was shortlisted for both the Dundee International Book Prize and the Bloody Scotland Book of the Year Award. Ooh! His Sterling Set series, which begins with No Man's Land and features close protection expert Connor Fraser, has been hailed as tense, fast-moving and bloody, and atmospheric, twisty and explosive with a complex cast of characters and a compelling, <laughs> easy for me to say. No Man's Land was long listed for the 2019 McIlvany Award. Woo! No Place to Die, right there beside, right there beside Trevor's book, um, is out now, has been hailed as amazing by New York Times best-selling author Mike Lupica. Woo! As a father of two girls, Neil finds himself regularly outnumbered in his own home. 
It's only right. He is also one of the four blows in search of a plot, a quartet of crime writers who live write a story based on suggestions from the audience. The four blokes have appeared in England, Spain and Scotland. So everybody, um, Neil Broadfoot. Evening everyone. Sorry I was late to the party. It was one of those um, look after your parents days. The hat um, just as I've explained it to Vic, is a nod to an 80s TV detective, so bonus points if anybody can get who that is. I've also, I've got really bad lock in here and nobody deserves to be frightened by that. And I can see that Vic's laughing at me already. You know, I'm just here to embarrass her really. Anyway, this evening I will make it short, sharp and bloody, as I've said. She's gonna type, she's gonna type something nasty to me. Shut up and get on with it, you tosser. Okay, right, okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> no, you meant that. Um, <laughs> I'm going to read the intro to No Man's Land, which um, introduces us to Connor Fraser and gives you a flavour of the kind of world that he lives in. I apologise for the swears in advance, but hey, I'm Scottish. You know, it happens. Connor Fraser collapsed against the church wall, rain slicked granite driving icy, needle, icy needles into his back and shoulders. He focused on the sudden chill, tried to use it to clear his thoughts, calm the white noise of pain and confusion and rage. Blood pumped over the hand he had clamped across the wound to his leg, hot and slick between his fingers. He took a deep breath, ignored the flash of pain in his chest, exhaled a cloud of steam into the night air. The voice drifted from the shadows, as warm and cloying as the blood pouring from his leg. You okay, Connor? Watch your step. Last thing we want is you slipping and breaking your neck. Been enough death here recently. Connor looked into the darkness opposite, trying not to think of what had been left there only days ago. Knew now it had been a message for him. A message crafted in blood and pain, designed to make his life a horror story. His attacker slid from the shadows, moving closer. Connor saw muscles tense, the final attack close. The knife rose slowly, flaring orange as it caught the glow from a streetlight overhead. Connor braced himself against the church wall, tried to draw strength from the ancient stone. Come on then, he hissed, dragging his gaze from the ghost in front of him. I've not got all night, and this is getting fucking boring. Another smile, almost genuine this time. Mr. Take Charge, huh, Connor? I always liked that about you. A glance down at the knife. Well, if you insist. Connor pushed off the wall as hard as he could as his attacker lunged, using inertia to try and make up for the weakness in his leg. He surged forward, fury and pain finally erupting from him in a roar that filled his ears drowning out even the hammering of his heart. They collided in a tangle of limbs and fell to the cobbles, writhing. Connor's leg was engulfed in agony as he jerked the wrong way, the sudden pain forcing another scream from him. He felt small, hard fingers scrabble across his, across his face and twisted away, eyes searching desperately for the knife. He grabbed for it, felt the crazed strength of his attacker behind the blade, inching it closer, closer to his face. He took another breath, tasted blood at the back of his throat, and gripped the arms that were quivering with the effort of driving the knife towards his face. Thought about letting go for an instant, the knife digging into the soft flesh under his chin, blade slicing sideways and down to tear open his windpipe, blood and gristle splattering onto the cobbles. He could let it end with him, let the blood be the last. Couldn't he? And that's the start of No Man's Land. What do you think he got on with it? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, had a few comments for people. Oh, we've got a question as well. Mm. Can't find it. Alex has asked a question. When is this coming out on audiobook? Alex, I'm worried that I... No, I think this must be for Neil because it was only a minute ago. Neil, when are your books out on audiobook? I actually think... Alex has asked me this before, and I can finally give him a definitive answer that it's coming out on Audible in September. I just found out that the deal has been struck. So it's September. I've got no idea who's narrating it. I know, given the reading I just gave, it definitely won't be me. Um, but other than that, I've got no idea who it's going to be. Um, but I know it's coming out in September on Audible. So save up your Audible credits now, kids. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, oh, I've got another one. Heck. No, it's the same one. Super. Um, Has anybody answered about the hat? Yes. Our very own Danny Marshall was straight in there, although we did have a few guesses. Magnum PI. I've heard yes. of that. First time. Neil, I don't know what it is. I'm too young. 
You're dead to me, Watson. Dead. Good night, everyone. It was fun <laughs> while it lasted. Good night. <laughs> Genuinely too young, don't know, never seen it. Sorry. Um, Higgins? Sure. Yeah. Um, apparently, Magnum was Derek Farrell's first crush. Thank you. Derek, we need to talk now. I'm going to look him up now just because you've said that. So You've got to be lying. You cannot, you call yourself a crime aficionado and you do not know Magnum PI. I've never, ever called myself that meal at all. Ever. Oh, I'm calling you it now. You put it on a t-shirt for next time. I actually thought when you said you're lying that you were going to say you're much older than you're trying to make out, in which case you were dead to me, so... Wait a minute. In my intro, you said that I... Oh. ...in a female-dominated household. Would I be stupid? Oh, who keeps muting them? It's not even me. It's not me. Simon, you're a legend. Trevor Wood says Vic thinks Magnum is an ice cream and a very nice ice cream it is too, Trevor. Yeah. And Rob Scrag has uh, weighed in with, had you more of a Higgins kind of guy, Derek? I don't know what any of this means. Anyway, so thank you everyone for tuning in just for us to be mean to each other. Stuff to keep you entertained this week. Tartan Noir with um, Teresa Talbot is a podcast. Teresa will be with us in a few weeks. Blood Brothers podcast with M. Sean Coleman, Chris McDonald, and some dude called Rob, Rob Parker. Some, some dude who can do an awesome Mike Reed impression. <laughs> <laughs> Why have you given me the sound thing? <laughs> because everyone has complimented your laugh this evening, so we just had to hear it again. What um, do, you want? do you want to hear like a little... Uh... You know, you don't want to hear that, do you? <laughs> I think that's a different conversation you'd be having elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs> With that in mind, if you haven't had enough of Rob and Trevor already, the Northern Crime Syndicate are doing um, a live Q&A. Is that right, Trevor? Sort of thing? It's a panel, Vic, tomorrow. So who's, who's interviewing? Because I haven't been asked. Uh, Adam is leading it. Adam Peacock is hosting. Guess what? He's going to be with us in a few weeks. Oh, He's nice. Great. And get, guess who else? Judith O'Reilly, Rob Scrag. It's like, you know, we've Northern Crime Syndicate. The whole crew. <laughs> um, if you would like to see the Northern Crime Syndicate panel tomorrow, it is from 7.30 p.m. on their Facebook page, and you can register there. I believe it's working a bit like this. You need to register in advance. Is that right, guys? Okay. That's right, yeah. I'm getting some nods. Thank you very much. Okay, William Shaw, every day... I think of, yeah, four o'clock, he is interviewing crime writers and people in the biz. So if you are free at four, I would massively recommend that. He's had some amazing crime writers and I believe Val McDermott is with him at some point this week. Absolutely. If you've missed any of those, you can catch up with them. He posts them on his Facebook page. So even if you don't watch live, you can catch up with them later if you're too busy at four o'clock. Um, the Red Hot Chili Writers podcast with Abby Mukherjee and Vaseem Khan is always great value so definitely um, tune in to that one. I think that's all. Don't forget to email if you want to win a free book. I would like to thank all of you who've been in the audience tonight. I would like to thank all of our readers who've given us lots of lols as well as some fantastic crime fiction and um, just general loveliness to be part of um, the crime fiction crew while all of this weirdness is going on because it is really weird and getting weirder by the week I think anyway and it's just lovely to see you all chatting responsibly and not having to be kicked out by Nikki Black who just sits there <laughs> silently watching everything um if you would like your event mentioned at future virtual noir at the bars please just drop me an email because we've got lots of people who are fans of crime fiction and lots of time on our hands so we're always looking for things to do um, during the lockdown so please do let me know um, you will be receiving an email if you have been successful for one of these free books and you will all of you will be receiving an email in a couple of days about where you can find everyone where you can buy their books where you can follow them on social media my biggest thanks as always goes to Simon Buick who is the invisible force behind all of this who does all of the lovely tech stuff um, for us. Simon will be appearing in front of the camera in a few weeks so do tune in for that even if you 
you know, want to hear his work or you just want to see what he looks like. The guy who keeps this all together because he is a star and we wouldn't be able to do it without him. I've got to say, um, hashtag of the night has to go to Danny Marshall, fuck you Maltesers. So please let's get this going, for sure. I want to see that trending on Twitter. Please, please make it happen. Anyway, we've got some cracking writers coming up next week. They will be revealed in your email very soon in the next couple of days. Stay tuned for the link to register for next week. And thank you so, so much for tuning in. Um, please stay safe. And we'll see you hopefully all next week. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vic. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Vic. Thank you. Oh, is anyone still here? Yep. <laughs> oh, my glasses. Hi, everyone. Hi. Yeah. Is this are we still public or are we private just... now? I'm still I'm here, Rob. I think everyone can hear us. <laughs> oh. oh, really? <laughs> Vic, Vic, that was amazing. Brought in and mute yourself. I haven't oh, muted myself yeah, yeah. for the first time in my life. <laughs> <laughs> that was yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah.